Well, hello everybody. Man, oh man. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's Wednesday night. We've got some rain deluxe. Wow, has it rained. I hope you didn't get any hail damage wherever you're at, wherever you live. I've seen some today firsthand and uh, it has been something else. So thanks for thanks for joining me today. I was I was matter of fact, I was singing right before we came on. Uh who am I that a king would live and die for? Who am I? Who am I? Who are you today? And that's what I want to share a little bit. Uh, hello there, Joanna Potter. I want to share a little bit about uh, from Colossians. Uh, and, and really, a lot of people think that we... Uh, we need a bunch of deliverance ministries, and, and I, I'm not totally against those, but I got to tell you, what we really need is we need people to know who their identity is. Hey, my brother David, good to see you, and good to see my wife. Hey, y'all. Uh, and uh, so we don't need deliverance ministries as much as we need to know who we are in Jesus Christ. Hey, Kimberly Leatherwood. So if you have your Bibles, I want to show you where we're going to be. I'll have it on the screen so that you can see it there. And uh, it's uh, we're going to start in Colossians. And uh, I just want to have a Bible study tonight because this is Wednesday night, and this is what normally we do on Wednesday night. And uh, even though I can't be with you uh, in the flesh, we can be together this way. And uh, hello, Robin Rice. Bless blessings, blessings. So if you have your Bibles there, uh, I'm going to start reading right there. Hi, Cindy. Blessings to you, too. Colossians, the first chapter. I'm going to start with verse 9. Verse 9 is the start of a prayer. This sounds kind of like, uh, hey, Brother Glenn and Sister Donna, sounds kind of like a prayer that you can read in Ephesians, and that's a prayer I tell everybody. Uh, the first chapter of Ephesians is something I pray for myself every day. Uh, and this is a prayer that Paul, same writer, is, is praying, and he's talking about how that all of the people that are faithful ministers of Christ, in verse 9, he starts out this way. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, heard what? Heard how that you're following the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> since we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled. Here's that prayer, the same prayer in Ephesians, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You see, the, the, <clears throat> the thing is, the world, the world knows about knowledge. The world, world has this thing down where knowledge is power, knowledge and power is control. But the word says, in all you're getting, get understanding. A lot of people have a lot of head knowledge, but they don't have common sense knowledge. And then we can have knowledge of a lot of things, but if we don't have the knowledge of the truth, you see, God said in his word, he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And so if you're trying to figure out God's word intellectually, intellectually and by your brain, it's not, it's not going to compute. So he says, that's my prayer in verse 9, and now I'm reading verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful. Everybody says, be fruitful. Can I hear you say, be fruitful? <clears throat> Amen. In every good work and increasing, here it is again, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. This is a prayer that Paul's praying for the church at Colossae, but it's a prayer that can be prayed for myself and for one another, and to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. It's the worst thing in the world to see somebody that says, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and they're sadder than a sad sack that you ever saw in your life, lower than a snake's belly in a in a in a deep wagon rut. I mean, they're just they're just crying and moaning and groaning. You're like, man, I don't want to I don't need any to be part of that, and I don't want to be any part of that. But I'm gonna tell you there's good news in the word, and that's why I put this up there, who am I? Uh, in the in the corner of the screen, and what our identity is. I, I gotta I got I to gotta be honest with you. Our, my uh, really, really good friend who has also gone on and, and beat me to the punch, she's reached the goal, and uh, that's Rhonda Harvey. Uh, Rhonda was a gal that, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes it, it, it irritated me early on because I didn't understand what she was saying. You say, how are you doing, Rhonda? And she'd say, I'm, highly, I'm blessed and highly favored, okay? Well, that's not what I was expecting her to say, but she'd say it every time. 
Okay. I mean, those of you who know uh, uh, our, our good friend, that's what she said. Well, then the Lord began to show me. See, she was ahead of the game. She was ahead of the curve than I was. That That's what we are. We are blessed and highly favored. I talked to somebody today, somebody very close to me, and, and this was the line. Well, we can't win for losing. Anybody ever hear that? We can't win for losing. But I, here's what I want to tell you. Change that. Change it to, I can't lose for winning. I can't lose for winning. And if you know your identity, if I know my identity in Christ, who I am, we're going to be just like my good friend always said, I am blessed and I am highly favored. So let's go on to the word. He says, giving thanks, I'm at verse 12, Colossians 1, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers. Ah, let's slow down. Have you ever... I had to qualify for something, qualify for a loan. They got to prove that you can pay the loan. Qualify for a race. In the Olympics, there's qualifications in ra in 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 uh, car racing and that sort of thing. Uh, you gotta you gotta do a qualifying lap. Well, here's the good news. I don't have to do the qualifying myself. My my qualification has already been made by Jesus Christ. That's what verse 12 is saying. Giving thanks to the Father, which hath made us meet. That word meet means fit. It also means qualified. So let me read it that way. Giving thanks to the Father, which hath made me qualified. He's qualified me to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. In other words, he made me to be sharing an inheritance. I don't know I don't know how many of you have have gotten big inheritances in your life in this life, but you know what? I've got an inheritance that is truthfully out of this world. And if you are a believer and a follower in Jesus Christ, that's who you are. So you are blessed and highly favored. I'll tell you what, this is good stuff. So I'm glad you joined me. We're, we're, we're tuning out all the, 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 gar the garbage. Woo, somebody shined, just showed up. And that's probably the sun. I know it's the sun behind me. If you saw the cross just come on, wow. Uh, that was because a cloud probably passed and the sun's really shining through. So it's, let's go on. Verse 13. Who hath delivered us? See, there's the part. So we don't need a deliverance ministry. I don't need a deliverance ministry if I know who I am. I have already been delivered. I've already been delivered by the power in the name of Jesus Christ by his finished work on the cross. Who hath delivered, and I like to make this personal. I'm reading Colossians 1.13. Who hath delivered me who hath delivered you, my friends in the Lord, from the power of darkness. That's what he delivered us from. And I want to show you something on down here. I, I, I'm not going to worry about time. All, you all are, are saying that to me. And uh, I love that, Lynn Allen. P price paid in full. That's exactly right. There's no more you owe, Lynn Allen. There's no more I owe. Nan, there's no more you owe, Carla. It's already been paid for. Isn't it, isn't it cool to go up and, and, and go into a, a restaurant? I mean, I've had it happen, and I've done it for other people. You sit there, and you order your meal, and, and then you're asking the waitress, hey, where's, where's my ticket? She says, it's already been paid for. Who paid for it? Well, that guy that was right over there or somebody that already walked out. Man, that's, that's a really big deal. But this is the big deal. This is the huge deal. He says, so, who hath delivered me from the power of darkness. I don't have any more right. My foot is not in the power of darkness. My feet are standing on the rock in the light. He says, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. This is all, this is all who you are in Jesus Christ. This is not, I'm waiting for heaven to get here so I can so I can be right. You are right. God's made you right. And the thing we got to understand is God's not mad at nobody. He's not mad. He already knew. He already knows exactly how we're going to act. He already has the provisions made. A, a sinner acts like a sinner. Somebody that is in bondage acts like somebody that's in bondage. But somebody that knows who they are in Jesus Christ and knows the deliverance from the power of darkness and knows that the finished work of Christ set us free 
put us in a qualifying mode to be partakers and to share in the inheritance. Why? We, we, we got nothing but, but joy in us. So he goes on, he says, in whom we have redemption. There's another one. Can I hear everybody say, we have? We have. There you go. We have. I have. I'm not going to get it somewhere down the road. I've already got redemption. I have already been redeemed. In fact, I, I, I've got a napkin sermon that I can't wait to share, and it tells about the day of Pentecost. It shows how that Jesus is our first fruits after resurrection. He, he rose again as a first fruit in the feast of the, uh, of, of the tabernacles. He, 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 he rose again, and it shows that he that was the beginning of the countdown of the 49 days now to Pentecost, to 50 days. And I want to show you how that it goes all the way back. It, well, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, the Word and the Spirit. But when the children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt's bondage. That was the 50-day mark was when God ascend, descended down to Mount Sinai. The Word and the Spirit spoke and set them free from the Egyptian bondage. Well, Jesus did exactly the same thing, and then Pentecost rolls around, and that 50-day mark sets us totally free with the power to go on and to win this world. Man, so let me read on. Who is the image? Oh, no, I didn't finish 14. So if you're just now following me, if you're just now with me, we're Colossians 1. Uh, I'm reading verse 14, and man, Thank you. See, you're right, Kimberly. It's already done. Claim and live our true identity. Listen, if you know for sure that you know, and I've heard this all my life, if you know that you know that you know that you know, and I want to tell you, I know that I know. I, there is no question. There is, there is no, I wonder what if. I know who I am in Jesus Christ. And as my dear friend used to say, I am, and she's really blessed now. I am blessed. I'm highly favored. If you want to get right down to it, yeah, I know what my identity is as far as Mike Harris is concerned, but I want to tell you, as a child of the Most High God, I have already been completed in Him. I'm just acting out what He's already seeing. He sees the beginning from the end. He knows exactly where He's going to take me in this journey, and He knows exactly where He's going to take you to. I keep getting those flashes of light, and it's like, whoo, glory. So, in verse 14, he says, in whom we have redemption. We already have it. It's already done deal. We have redemption and through his blood. That's how we get it. Through his blood. Now, some of you may have put some ribbon over your doorpost and stuff for the for the for this time just as a symbolic. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to do it. And if you do it, don't hurt anything either. It's just symbolic of saying, look, I know who I am. I know that the blood will cover me throughout this and anything else. And he says, in him we have redemption through his blood. Now, King James says, even the forgiveness of sins, almost as if that's an afterthought. I don't like the way the King James Version, you all know and understand King James Version 1611 is also a translation, okay? Some will say, no, it's the Holy Word of God. And with, yeah, and no, it's a translation, okay? So we don't have the original scripture. So there's sometimes that, uh, that I, I, don't, I don't, even the forgiveness of sins, uh, that if, if we some of us are living like we have, we'll never go on go beyond like what life has taught us how to live. Let me say it, let me say it this way: some are never going beyond what life is teaching them as to who they are, versus what the Word of God is teaching them as to who they are. You are no longer what you used to be or once was once you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've denied yourself and you're following Him. And I want to say something about that. I, I've said it in many broadcasts and, and I, I was, was prompted to, to say, you need to, you need to elaborate on that a little bit because I tell people, it's not just inviting Jesus in your little heart. That's not scriptural. 
come into my heart. Well, the thing is, yes, he comes into your heart, but really he comes into your whole being. That's the difference. He comes in, I'm going to tell you, I'm wall to wall, Holy Ghost. I'm wall to wall. This is the temple of the living God. And he lives not in just my heart, but he lives inside of me. He is who I am for me to live is Christ. So he goes on and he says this. He says, who is the image of the invisible God? Who's the image of the invisible God? He's talking about Jesus. So Jesus was the image of the invisible God. And guess who else now who's the image of Jesus is supposed to be? It's supposed to be you. That's who you are. 1 John 4 says, as they are, as we are in this world, so are you. As we are God the Father and Jesus the Son, as we are in our relationship, as we are as one, and as we are visible to the world, that's 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 who you and I are. We are the image of the we are his image. So he starts out, Jesus is the invisible or the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, there's that firstborn, there's that first fruits, the firstborn of every creature. Now, when you think about firstborn, what do you think about? I think about position. Truly, if you're the firstborn, you, especially in, in, in the Bible times, you had you had the run of the mill. I mean, you were the you had the most important position, if you would. Now I know we make we make uh, remarks and we fun about you know the middle boy and girl and the baby and all that stuff. Matter of fact, my brother and I were doing that this week, just just ha having a good time. But when you when you talk about firstborn here in the scripture, he's talking about position, and position is important. So Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn. He has the position of every creature, for by him were all things created. Now, most of us aren't, aren't squabbling over that, but in the Colossae time when Paul was writing this letter, there was at least one particular guy that was saying that Jesus was created, a created being. In other words, he wasn't before all things and part of the creation. So that's part of what Paul, so when you read Colossians, you got to understand that's what Paul was fighting. He was fighting uh, a, a very popular teaching at the time that said, well, Jesus was just another created being. So that's why in verse 16, he says, for by him or since by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. <laughs> there you go. Visible and invisible. You, do you ever think that the the crazy movies that we see sometimes, you're going, where does this stuff come from? Well, it comes from somebody's mind that has an idea and an understanding and probably an experience of the spiritual world. So there, there's, the reality is what is not being seen is every bit, if not more real, than what is being seen with these eyes. So he says, for by, by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, all things were created by him. Oh, and for him. Okay. So he goes on and he is before all things. And by him, all things consist. There's going to be an ultimate time that everything is transferred back to the owner. <laughs> I want you to get that for just a minute. Everything, when it's all is said and done, everything is going to be transferred back to the original owner. So with that in mind, it says he's before all things, by him all things consist, and he's the head of the body. He's the head of the body. We are the body of of Christ. That's why we're seeing such a tremendous outbreak. I love my brothers who are and ministers who are sharing. Pastor Philip Barnett's sharing right now. Matter of fact, he called me just before I went on and he said he asked me a question about uh, us putting his message on YouTube so he could share because he's with Wayne Long right now in Oklahoma City. So as soon as you, if you're watching me here, you get off, you can go and watch Wayne Long's uh, message if you don't 
can't find it i'll give it to you we're working together but that's what that is what is so exciting to me is because we are being the church the body of christ we are being jesus and blue jeans right here we don't have to have we found out we don't have to have a brick and mortar building in fact that's not where it's happening it's happening right here in me through me in you there you are and through you okay so let's read on he's the head of the body of the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead he's still talking about jesus not the church jesus is the firstborn from the dead he's the beginning that in all things he jesus might have preeminence for it pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell verse 20 and having made peace through the blood of his christ cross having made peace when he said it's finished he made peace with the blood that he shed and the work of the cross he made reconciliation possible between us and god the father and having made peace through the blood of christ by him to reconcile all things unto himself now hang on all things he didn't say all people Having made peace, hang on with me for just a minute. Having made peace through the blood of his, of, of his cross, and I'm in verse 20 of Colossians 1, by him to reconcile, you all know what when you do reconcile, I, I know the younger generations, they, they don't know what reconciling a bank statement looks like. They go to the teller in the ATM and go, how much, how much money do I have? Okay. Uh, not all of them. I, I'm making a blanket statement, but but uh, truthfully, uh, my generation and most of you that I see watching me, mm -hmm, I see I see those ages. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know what it is to reconcile a bank book, and that's you bring it into balance. You bring it into balance. Well, that's what he Jesus did by the work of the cross. He brought us into balance again because we were way out of balance and not only us, but things. Because he says, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things, there's the word, things in heaven. You remember what he said over in Matthew? Uh, Ma I, I, let, me, let me just throw over there real quick. Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 11, he says, For the Son of Man has come to save, the, the, you all know the scripture, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. doesn't say, the Son of Man came to save the people that were lost. We're part of it, but he says that which was lost. What's he talking about that? Well, if you go to Luke and I, I didn't put these on the, the screen. You'll, you, please forgive me. Luke 19 and uh, verse. Whew. This is bet, a lot better than Matlock, isn't it? Luke 19 and verse. I'm about there. 10. Well, he's talking about Zacchaeus. And, and, and Jesus' encounter is his encounter with Zacchaeus. And in this, starting at verse 8, Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Now remember, Zacchaeus, was a, he, was, he was a guy that was taken from everybody, and, and all Jesus had to do was say, Zacchaeus, come out of that sycamore tree. I'm, I'm going I'm to have lunch with you today. I'm going to have dinner with you. And man, just the presence of Jesus causes Zacchaeus to say, You know what? I'm going to give 50% of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken away anything by false accusation, I'm going to give back four times the amount. Now, that's, that's pretty hefty. And verse 9 of that chapter 19 says, And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. There's so much in here I want to share, but I, I want to get to back to that. The Son of Man came to save that which was lost. So in verse 10, he says, For the Son of Man, same thing we just read in Matthew 18, for the Son of Man is to come, and for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? My identity, my purpose. 
my vision that's what was lost i was born into sin i was born a sinner a born into darkness and i did not understand what my true reasoning for being was i didn't understand that my identity when you say who am i i can now say i've been born again and so because I am denying myself and following Jesus Christ, I am a child of the Most High God. In, in fact, He chose me. I didn't choose Him. He chose you, child of God. He went seeking after you. <laughs> Excuse me. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. I don't know how... how excuse me while I... I should have brought some coffee. We should add some coffee. I don't know why I'm drinking water. But it, they say it's good for you. But, you know, water's nectar of Jehovah. And so, <clears throat> well, water is too. But let me, let, me, let me go on. So that's what he came to seek and to save. So when he says, back in our study on Colossians 1.20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things, what Christ did was he set everything back in order for you. He set it back in order for me. He dispelled the powers of darkness. He brought the death and the grave to nothing. He took their power totally away. And then when he resurrected and went to the Father, what he did was he said, Now, it's done. I've done everything. Matter of fact, I've given you everything you need that you need to accomplish the work for my kingdom. And so what you need to do is be praising the Lord instead of whining and crying and moaning and groaning about what we don't have and what we need. And, oh, God. Lord's saying, I've already given it to you. I've already blessed you with everything you have. That's who you are. That's your identity. So that's why I say we don't need deliverance ministries as much as we need ministries that preach the truth of God's word. And you start living this out. You start living out your true identity. You start believing that you're a child of the Most High God, that you have everything you need. You'll start acting like it. We're about to finish here, and I just want to say again, I like that hallelujah, Robin Rice Payne. Hallelujah is right. Vitadine, you are a child of God. Oh, man, to change things from. That's right. So what he goes on and he says, having made peace, I've just got to read it again. I've just got a few more verses here with us. Having made peace through the blood of his Christ, cross, by him to reconcile all all things unto himself because you see one of these days every absolutely everything will be reconciled it will be brought back into the balance that it started with in genesis in the very beginning it'll be brought back to that kind of an order so you can count on it and by the way it's really soon it's sooner than you might even imagine so he says I say whether they things be things be in earth or things in heaven. And you, that's you, that's me, you, that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind, that's the biggest battleground. That's the biggest battleground we fight. Do you know you can sit and absolutely, it's garbage in, garbage out. It's good stuff in, good stuff out. It's purity in, purity out. It's truth in, truth out. You can absolutely fill your mind with all the negativity, with all the fear monger stuff, with stuff that is legit, but even stuff that is enhanced beyond legitimacy. You can do that to the point where your mind has gotten to a place where you, you're afraid to walk out a door. You're afraid to wake up. You're afraid to do anything. That's not the life that God intends for us to live. It's just not. we got to be wise. I don't go running off the roof of my house just to test God. I know gravity's going to work, and this big old body's going to come plunging down, and it's going to hurt. So we've got to use wisdom. But in wisdom, 
get understanding of what's going on. So he says, we were enemies and alienated at one time in our mind. That's why Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, we got to be transformed daily. we gotta, we got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How do we renew, renew our mind? By the Word of God. Because that's truth. Your feelings, your emotions, they're not truth. They're not. Well, I don't feel this, or I feel this, or I don't feel blah, 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 blah. Okay, you go by that, you are in a whirlwind of a life. But you go by God's Word, and even when you don't feel saved, God's Word says you are. Even when you don't feel forgiven, God's Word says you are forgiven. Even when you don't feel loved, don't believe that lie. God loves you. He loved you while you were a sinner. He loved me while I was a, a, a yet a sinner. So what makes me think when I mess up and I, I, I miss the mark on occasion that he stops loving me? That's religion. That's man-made thinking that is performance-based and God is not that kind of a God. So get it in your mind of what God's Word says. And, and, and listen, the more you hear His Word, the more faith will grow in you. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so you start, here's what pe people do. You start getting down, and you know what people do? They, they run away from God. They don't go to church. They don't want to read the Bible. They don't want to get around somebody that's loving on the Lord. That's the worst thing you can do. Those are the very people, and that's the very tools that you need to get your teeth back into. So you start feeling down in the mully grubs. Get your Bible out. Turn to the book of Psalms. Turn to, to some of the epistles and start reading. Turn to Ephesians 1. Turn to Colossians 1, where we are, and read this prayer that Paul's praying. So let me, let me get in these last three verses. So we are sometimes enemies and alienated by our minds. You know, if we just start where Jesus finished, we'd be ahead of the game. I'm going to say it again. If we just start where Jesus finished, we'd be ahead of the game. Where did he finish? He finished with, it's done. <laughs> I, I've done it for you. I've taken care of it. You're all good. So now just start living out the life. Well, we still got to go through life. We, we still have flesh and blood and, and life still happens. It, it, but, but he said, look, you, you're going to go through junk. You're going to go through tribulation. I'm not talking about the great tribulation. I'm just talking about life tribulations. You're going to go through stuff. But hey, be of good cheer. I've overcome few of the things. I hope I've overcome enough that you'll be okay. No, I've overcome the world. <laughs> I've overcome the entire world. So be of good cheer. And he says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. And by the way, I'm going to the, to the Father and I'm going to send the Holy Ghost. So he's going to come as a comforter, as a teacher. And he's not going to dwell on tablets of stone. He's going to dwell in men's hearts. And so what you got to do is get your mind lined up with that spirit that is within you. That new, renewed, born again, child of God experience. That spirit, that's what you got to get a hold of. So let me, let me, let me get to a closing point here. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind, I'm finishing up with Colossians 1, 21, and I'll go to 23. Enemies in your mind, by wicked works, yet now, everybody say, yet now, that's it, yet now, hath he reconciled. I'm not just a forgiven sinner. I'm a reconciled child of the living God. I am an heir and a joint heir. My brother in Christ sits on the right hand of the throne of God. <laughs> uh, it, it ought to be, give us reason to shout. So he goes on, he says, in the body of his flesh through death, Jesus, he did all that to present you, me, holy, holy. I used to think, man, nobody could be holy. Baloney. Yes, you can. Yes, you are. Yes, I am. Yes, you should be, as long as you identify with who Jesus says that you are according to his word. Okay? Everybody say, I'm holy. I hear it. And unblameable. Unblameable. 
The reason we're unbelievable is he says he justifies us. What does that word justify mean? Justify means as if we never did anything. That's what he did. Man, oh, read Hebrews. When you, when you get off here, if you're making notes, go to Hebrews and Hebrews 10. 10.10 10 for sure. But read, start in Hebrews 10, and it'll show you how that the sacrifices of bulls and all that, all that stuff, it didn't work. It didn't do it. But what Jesus did once and for all, he nailed everything. We were guilty. We were guilty. But he nailed that conviction notice on the cross and said, look, I'm taking Mike's place. I'm taking Lynn Allen's place. I'm taking Kathy Harris's place. I'm taking Debbie Poplin, Vida Dean. I just go on up there and read. I'm taking your place. I didn't die just for you. Jesus died as you. There's a whole lot of difference in that perspective. And that's what he did. He died as me. To present me holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. That's without reproach. You can't, you can't, you can't go against it. Now, the accuser of the brethren, the enemy, he's the one accusing the brothers and sisters night and day. And if you listen, if you don't watch yourself, you're going to hear him accusing you, and then you will start listening to those lies and start accusing yourself. Listen, you ain't big enough to go against what God has already said about your identity. You're not too big. You're not bigger than God to say, well, yeah, God says I'm forgiven, but boy, not me. I don't feel forgiven. I've been justified, glorified, and identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Kimberly Custer, amen. Woo-hoo, glory. So let's go on, and we're going to get this last verse. Unreprovable uh, in his sight. If you're making notes, Romans 6. Romans 6, start about verse 9, you go through verse, about verse 13, same thing. You, go, you see, I believe that Scripture interprets Scriptures. That's one of, the, one of the wonderful things I've learned with my good brother, Philip Barnett. And he says, Scripture interprets Scripture. Don't, you, don't, you don't want to take anything out of context. That's why I started where I did. I'm going through the Scripture as we're going. And then I've read you other confirmations of, of Scripture. Listen, the, God's Word is not hard. The devil's made us think it's hard. The devil has made made us think, well, I, I, I don't understand that, so I'll just leave it off. That's a bald-faced lie. He's trying to keep you from the truth. He's kind of trying to keep you from identifying with who you really are, because once you start doing that, listen, and the gates of hell will not prevail against that kind of a revelation in Jesus Christ. So he goes on, he says, in the body of his flesh through death to present you, he's going to present us spotless, holy, unblameable, unreprovable, without reproach, in his sight, in whose sight? In his sight. Do you know it doesn't really matter what people think about me. <laughs> what matters is what God thinks about me, what Jesus thinks about me. And that's what matters. Listen, can, can, can I tell you, and this is coming from the guy that has been the pot calling the kettle black. I'm the guy that has always, through my life, tried to please people. I've been trying to be a man pleaser. That is not where God wants you to be. It's not where God wants me to be. He wants me to please him. And when I please him, I'm going to please whoever that he wants to be pleased. And there's going to some people that are never going to be pleased. So get over it. Get over yourself. Don't, just don't be getting on the side of the enemy and putting yourself down. If you're a child of the Most High God, that's your identity. You are are blessed and you are highly favored. You've been sought out. He sought you. He chose you from the very beginning. You have been predestinated. I'm 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 telling you what, you go back to I said Romans 6, and also now you go back to Romans 8, where it starts out in there where it says, For we know that all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. We know that. We know it if we know the truth. So in all you're getting, get understanding. If you continue, verse 23, this is closing. If you continue, if I say continue, there's nothing worse than running a race and quitting. I still remember a race in Sepulpa. I was, I, for my buddies that know, I was a shot put thrower and a discus thrower. I, I, I didn't run. I didn't run the races I ran because I had to run just to be on the, 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 the team. But there was a race that we were in a triathlon meet, tri meet, whatever you call them, three different schools. Somebody got sick, maybe Philip Nafee, in fact, if I, if I recall right. 
and it was a it was a 220 run and so you had to i had to run around that lap no maybe it's 120 i can't even remember uh I've, I've slept since then but anyway that full it was it was just a full lap whatever that is somebody will correct me and and the coach said, all you got to do is finish, Mike. It, it don't matter what place you get because we need someone to finish this race. And I remember running, man, I took off on that first first leg around that first corner and I was clipping it pretty good. And matter of fact, I was ahead of all everybody but one person. I was like, this ain't no deal. This ain't no deal. I'm going to be all right. About the time I rounded that first corner and about halfway through on the other side, I'm thinking, my... I can't breathe. I'm, uh, I'm I'm burning up here, and and my chest is on fire. And now all of a sudden, everybody's starting to pass me. And by the time I got around that last leg to the last little stretch there, it was embarrassing. I everybody done finished the race, and there I was. My legs. I'm serious. I thought the fire truck would be coming. They were on fire everywhere. Everything in my body was on fire. I wasn't used to running like that. I should have started out slower, but dummy me, I thought I can keep up. I can do this. But what happened was everybody in the stand started cheering me on. They started cheering me on. All I needed to do was finish the race. Oh my goodness, and I did. I, I finished the race. It was ugly, but I got across that line, and everybody was thrilled and happy. Thank God they never asked me to run again. But let me let me finish here. If you continue in the faith, that's what I'm getting at. Continue in the faith. Grounded. How are we grounded? Grounded in what? Not grounded in a bunch of false doctrines and a bunch of wishy-washy stuff. I'm going to tell you where the grounding is. It's grounded in, in God's word and his loving truth of his word. God's a God of love. God is love. First John 4, 7 and 8 says, if you don't love, you don't even know God. And I, I got I got to be honest. We see a lot of stuff on Facebook, and and we so-called believers and Christians, it don't look like we know God at all because what we're stating and throwing out there doesn't it doesn't look like love to me. We need to be careful and continue in the faith that we started in, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. In other words, there ain't no budging. And there's no budging me whatsoever. You can't offend me. You can't make me mad. You can't set me on fire. You can't do any of that if I stay grounded and rooted and settled in what God's Word says about me. Which you've heard and which was preached in every creature which is under heaven, whereof Paul says, I am made a minister. So what I want to say in closing here is just keep believing what God says about you. Keep seeing what God sees from his perspective about you. And I'll end with this. <laughs> I said it earlier, and if you missed it, I can't lose for winning. Instead of I can't win for losing, I can't lose for winning. And today is a gift. It's not a grind. God bless you. Thanks for being with me. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for praying for one another. God bless you. Better things are ahead.